the interesting thing is that the surveillance team didn't quite know what was going on. I mean, you, strange behavior by these two individuals. By the way, Assad Sarwar was not on anybody's list, even though he had been to Pakistan as well. So he's just this random guy uh, that he's having this very strange conversation with. That was obviously alertive, and so they start they start watching him too. And so finally, the cops said, "We got to break this up somehow." Yeah. And so they sent like a, a a couple of cops to say, "Hey, what are you guys doing?" Like literally, like making content. They said, "Oh, we're not doing anything. We're just uh, just royal gossip." Yeah, we're just right. we're just yeah. It's all good. Yeah. It's interesting. This incredibly low tech way to communicate yeah. was actually the most effective. Don't mm-hmm. use your phones. Don't meet in a house. Don't meet in a coffee shop. Don't send emails. This was the best way to do it. But it was so alertive to the police that they knew that something big was happening. I'm David Priest, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, December 20th, 2021. In 2006, al-Qaeda trained operatives planned and nearly executed an operation to destroy passenger aircraft over the Atlantic Ocean. Because it was discovered and stopped, it did not accomplish its purpose killing thousands of people in the air and possibly hundreds or thousands on the ground. Aki Peritz is a former CIA intelligence officer and currently adjunct professor at American University who has researched and written all about this transatlantic airliner plot. He has recently published a new book about it all called Disruption Inside the Largest Counterterrorism Investigation in History. I sat down with Aki to talk about the conspiracy and the heroic efforts by the intelligence services of the United States, Great Britain, and even Pakistan to uncover and crush it. It's the Lawfare Podcast, December 20th, the largest counterterrorism investigation in history with Aki Peretz. You did a whole lot of research for this project. It's amazing that this plot from, what, 15 years ago now The contours of it were known, but so many of the details weren't known until you pulled them all together. How did you do that? The funny thing is, is that the British gave us a lot of information in their court documents. The crazy thing about it is a lot of this stuff, a lot of the email traffic, the signals intelligence that goes back and forth from Pakistan to London and other places, all that is top secret. And yet, for one reason or another the British actually uh, were able to both declassify it and have it in one of their trials. There were three trials. So they were in the second trial, and all this information, which normally is never, ever, 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 ever seen, shows up in the trial documents. Let me tell you that it's actually hard to get trial documents out of the UK because they (laughs) they have them for about a decade, and they kind of get rid of them after a while. And so I just happened to hit at the right point where I got all this information. I hit the mother load of information, and then... And then I was able to get it before it all disappeared. Another thing was is a lot of it was police surveillance. They had mm-hmm. a ton of surveillance notes. They had a ton of this surveillance team talked to this person and was watching this person. They had lots of information, lots of exhibits. All those things don't exist anymore because they just kind of disappear into the into the ether right. after about 10 years or so. So were so. you tracking those trials just out of personal interest and you noticed how much information in that second trial was coming out? No, the funny thing was is that people didn't really pay attention to any of these trials past the first couple of weeks. The first trial ended with some of these guys are convicted on lesser offenses, but the the major the major charges didn't stick for a variety of reasons. And so they asked, that's why they had to go to a second trial. They had to go to a third trial. One of the major guys actually got off completely scot-free. Mm-hmm. So the question was, what was going on here? And people people lose interest. They stopped the plot, and then you moved on with your life. But the reason why I really follow, I focused on this and I found it so interesting was my first book, which came out in 2012, called Find, Fix, Finish. This was a small chapter in that, and I realized there was so much more to this information, this, this story to tell. And I thought, gosh, I really want to do this. And unfortunately, kind of burrowed into my brain over the course of several years that I had to really get on this as quickly as I can because I knew that the trial information was going to disappear eventually, and I wouldn't be able to pull it. So that's why... I started collecting this information, you know, life gets in the way. And so I had this information. I did some really great interviews with a variety of people, uh, both in MI6 and MI5 and here in the States at the CIA, at NCTC, at the White House and other places. And I sort of put it all together. And then the the funny thing was COVID hit and I actually had the time to actually write the book. So that's (laughs) what I did. Nice. So that's where we end with the research and the writing of the book and the trials. We're going to come back to the trials later in the conversation. But let, let's wrap this back a little bit. Sure. So we have the context of 9-11, 
And after that in, what is it, 2004, Madrid is the March 2004. But somewhere in there, you had the Madrid train bombings that killed almost 200 and injured thousands. Then you had the attacks the following year in the UK, the Mm -hmm. 7-7 attacks in London, and then the lesser known but Mm -hmm. could have been similar attacks just two weeks later. So the people involved in those London attacks revolve around a guy named Rashid Raouf. Talk a little bit about him and what he did where up to and including those first two London plots. So Rashid Rauf is actually an inter- a very interesting guy. He was born he was born in Pakistan, but he came to the UK as a baby, and he lived in Birmingham. So he's functionally a Birmingham, England native. Mm-hmm. He grew up in East Birmingham, just a, just another one of these kids, a first or second gen, really a second generation kid. He spoke fluent English. He was he was he was perfectly English in in all his other ways. And he went to high school. He went to middle school and high school, and he he did some college. And then he was caught up in a in a strange incident, which I talk about in the book, where his uncle is murdered under extremely dubious circumstances. Hmm. And so he so his uncle is murdered in a in a three a.m. attack, a knife attack on the street. It's funny. Uh, Birmingham is a is a city of about a million people. And they, I looked up the, the statistics. I mean, murder is actually, you know, it's considered like kind of a dangerous city, but it only has about 24 to 30 murders a year. Hmm. So compared to American cities yeah. of similar so size, stand out. It, it doesn't, yeah. it, it's considered a very safe city. But putting that aside, his, his uncle is murdered, and then suddenly Rashid Rauf leaves the country. Hmm. Why would you leave the country? And his family began to stonewall the, the police investigation. He left with his, also his best friend, a fellow named Mohammed Gulzar. So Mohammed Gulzar and Rashid Rauf disappear. Mm-hmm. That is what you call in law enforcement a clue. <laughs> Was there any sign that he had been radicalized before this? It's it's really unclear. He was uh, he's actually considers himself Kashmiri. Uh, his his family's from a little a little village in Pakistan controlled Kashmir. Kashmir is basically between the Indians and the uh, and the Pakistanis. And there was there was an idea that there was there was a lot of Ajita in the 1990s, you had a lot of individuals coming through the UK on fundraising tours, people who are currently on the most wanted list, uh, the rewards for justice list. Mm -hmm. I actually looked up one. One of the people that reportedly connected with his with his father was a fellow named Hafiz Saeed. He was he was the head of he is the head of Lashari Taiba. There's a 10 million dollar bounty on his head, according to Mm. the State Department. And so all these people were coming through his 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 area, but it was never clear whether he was personally radicalized, but he leaves because of his uncle's murder, and then a lot of things happen, and then suddenly he is thick as thieves with a lot of other jihadi folks, and that's where the story really takes off, where 2003, 2004, 2005. By 2005, he is connected very well with al-Qaeda guys in Pakistan and also in the tribal areas, and he, he helps train some folks, a number of folks, who go back to the U.K., and commit these terrible attacks. Now, the, the interesting thing that, that I didn't quite realize when I was doing this research was when the 7-7 attack occurs, and this was actually the, the worst terrorist attack in London's history. 52 people died during a rush hour attack. I believe it's, it was the worst attack actually uh, since World War II in mm-hmm. terms of fatalities in a single mass casualty occurrence. The British and the, and the Americans had no idea these guys were coming until they set off their bombs. And that was obviously a huge wake-up call to the security services. And then when Rashid Rove's other cell, the 721 cell, tried to blow things up and for the, you know, they bumbled the the chemical precursors uh, so nobody died, they had no idea those guys were coming either. Mm -hmm. So remember, you had a massive, massive casualty attack. And then two weeks later, almost the same thing happens. And they had no idea who these guys were until the bombs went off. Now, you mentioned that they bumbled the uh, precursors. Explain what went wrong and then what was the solution that others then came upon to try to commit the next attack, the one we'll be talking about in depth? Sure. One of the things about making bombs is you need chemical precursors. And you can build explosives using household goods. But you need to know how to boil down certain household goods. In this case was hydrogen peroxide, which mm-hmm. you can buy at, at the drugstore. You can buy it at, at hair salons. You need to boil this stuff down to a certain consistency, to a certain um, mm-hmm. percentage, and then it turns into this gloppy material, and then you need to 
put it together, have a starter, and then you can you can take it and blow things up that way. Unfortunately, you need to bring it down to a a very high concentration. Mm. And the seven seven bombers figured it out because they knew how to do it. You needed to keep it cooled so it doesn't blow up in your apartment. The guys two weeks later weren't really following. They weren't really great students. Mm-hmm. Uh, or the the main the main ringleader who was who was showing his his buddies how to do this wasn't a great student, and so he he kind of bumbled the the recipe, and so they'd been trained by Al Qaeda in Pakistan, in Pakistan. Afghanistan, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, uh, probably in Pakistan. But the real uh, difference between seven seven and seven twenty one was simply that the, the first group were good students, and the second one just yeah. weren't as sharp. Yeah, so remember, kids, stay in school, right? Okay, <laughs> now they learned from that they not. You know, necessarily those individuals, although some of those individuals did learn from the 721 failures that these devices had little little flashes, but they, they didn't actually ignite fully. Yeah. So they knew they had to try something else. They knew they had to try something else. And I think more broadly, now remember, obviously, obviously you know this, David, but terrorism is political theater. Yeah. You, you had this massive attack on 77 that people remember, but essentially British society kind of went on. They just Things returned to normal really quickly. Really quickly. And in fact, uh, the FITSI, uh, the attack was on a Thursday. The FITSI lost 200 points until they closed it because of the attack. And then by Friday, it was up 210 points or something like that. <laughs> Hilton Hotels didn't really cancel. There were no cancellations in London. Mm-hmm. The the underground basically went back to normal as soon as they kind of cleaned did their up. invest, cleaned it up. Right, right. Everything went back to normal. So so the major so the shaking of the, the infidels, so to speak, never really occurred. And so... Y- if you were Al Qaeda, you'd say like, "Wow, this is a major attack," but it didn't really achieve the the larger strategic mm-hmm. effect that we really wanted. So we got to dream bigger, right? The British government reacted by cooperating even more intensely with the U.S. and the U.S. government reacted, but the British public kind of shrugged. Yeah, they right? kind of shrugged, and that's the interesting thing about. I think that's maybe one of the larger lessons one can learn is that one can have a resilient society. Mm-hmm. You know, London and British society has been has been dealing with with mostly Irish terrorism for a century or so. Uh, and so you've had some really awful attacks and near misses. But just like a person's body can, can you know, you can get sick and you can get cold and get a flu, but you can get over it. One can have a resilient society. One can have resilient uh, security services and sort of move on with life. Yeah. And you don't have to freak out over every single thing. Let's introduce another character here, someone central to what became known as Op Overt, the plot to take down the airliners. And this is Abdullah Ahmed Ali. He was actually born in London. He wasn't mm-hmm. even born in Pakistan and came nope. over as a baby. He he was a uh, native-born Brit. Tell us a little bit about him and how he got involved with this next stage of attacks. So Ali, he was uh, one of several children, middle-class immigrant family in Walthamstow, which is in East London. Went to went to middle school, went to high school, went to he had a college degree. He he lived a very working class, middle class English lifestyle. But this remember, this is the, this is during the time, you know, you had nine eleven occur and then you had the invasion of Iraq and a whole bunch of other things. And so there was a lot of feeling in this area where they said, Well, bad things are happening. You know, I, I tried to talk about this in the book where maybe when he was in high school he fell in with some some bad folks. He was interested in what the Taliban was doing in the 90s. This is pre-9-11. Mm-hmm. But a lot of kids are interested. You know, they're, they're interested. They're looking at certain things. I mean, why did this guy become interested and then do something about it? And that's one of the questions that that terrorism analysts are always wondering is that you you, you expose people to bad things and, and they feel bad about certain things. So why do they then take action? And for one reason or another, Ali decided to take action. He went to Pakistan. He fell in with some people. He saw firsthand, actually, the consequences of war in Afghanistan and the invasion of Afghanistan because he actually worked at one of these refugee camps on the on the border, in the, in the Pakistan mm-hmm. side of the Afghan-Pakistan border. And these are really dismal places, mm-hmm. like really awful places. And he was a, you know, a middle-class guy. You know, he has money in his pocket. He's got nice warm clothing. And there's all these, these Afghans coming in. They're dressed in rags. There's a lot of uh, sickness, like children die first in these kind of situations because of, of totally totally uh, preventable diseases like dysentery and mm-hmm. diarrhea and so forth. And so he was exposed to this firsthand. And bit by bit by bit, he became radicalized and he said, America and Britain are the enemy. Mm. And 
you know, a lot of people maybe feel that way. Very few people decide to make the take the next step. Right. And this is where Rauf and his colleagues watch him mm -hmm. and, and make sure that he's on the up and up because they're worried about having Americans and Brits infiltrate people like this mm -hmm. to try to get inside the al-Qaeda organization. Absolutely. So they watch him for a while and they think he's on the up and up and then they bring him in and give him some of this training, right? That's right. They give him some of the training. I mean, again, you can build, you can learn how to build a bomb on the internet, but chances are you're going to blow your hands off because you don't really know what you're doing and you, you strike something wrong or you touch something and, and it's game over. And in fact, that's what actually happened to several people in the, in the, in the tribal lands uh, around this time. They just touch something, touch two pieces of metal together, or they drop something, and poof, Boom. they're gone. The thing about Ali was he was like the 7-7 seven, seven attackers. He was a good student. He paid attention. Mm -hmm. People liked him. He was a charismatic fella, uh, and he could motivate people to do things. So he was there. Several other folks were in Pakistan at the time, and they said, this guy, this guy's a leader. Mm. And so instead of going to fight in Afghanistan and fight against the Americans, fight against the, the Afghan security forces, which you know, you'd have a very— You'd have a very short, uh, <laughs> a short life because eventually they'll figure out who you are, especially if you're a foreign national and they're going to zap you. Instead, Al Qaeda said, "Listen, you are an individual who has who has a clean record. You have no prison record. You're a you're a, f a family man. You're married. You have a kid on the way. We'd love you for you to go back to the UK and await instructions." And that's, that's interesting because Rauf isn't going back and leading things on the ground in the UK. He's sending team after team. And, and he wanted a leader, somebody who on the ground could bring people together, keep them focused, mm -hmm. uh, prevent any errors, which will end up coming up sure. anyway. Sure. But th that's all the, the precursors to the plot. Yeah. But the Brits in particular and the Americans are starting to smell that something is going on. And by what, June 2006, when Ali comes back to the United Kingdom on one of his trips, there's something unusual in his luggage. Uh, tell us what happened and how the how the Brits got some interesting information without Ali even knowing about it. Sure. Ali had been transiting back and forth from Pakistan from the UK uh, several times over the course of, let's say, two and a half years. I, I want to I preface this by saying this is not actually alertive because some 300,000 British citizens go to Pakistan every right. year anyways because, you know, they have family, they have one to do businesses, so it's, it's, mm -hmm. and lots of kinship ties. It's not abnormal. But because of Ali's strange behavior, uh, his relationships to some of the uh, tangential relationships to some of the bombers in 77721, mm -hmm. mostly the 721 fellows, he attracted attention. And so he comes back. And on one of his trips, he's carrying Tang, which is the, the orange drink, you know, the, the orange mix. And they said, that's strange. You have Tang here in the, uh, here in the UK. He's bringing it back from Pakistan. He's bringing it back from Pakistan. Uh -huh. And it's like, why didn't you just... That's that's yeah. odd. Why would you bring that back? Okay. He goes back to Pakistan, comes back, and he's got three dozen batteries. Batteries? Why? You can get batteries in the United Kingdom. That's well. right. You can get batteries in the Why United Kingdom. Why would he Kingdom. be bringing Pakistani batteries? That's right. Why would you bring <laughs> a lot of batteries? And that's and that was extremely alertive. Hmm. Now, obviously, if you put batteries in your in your luggage, that's not a big deal. In fact, nobody will care about mm -hmm. that at all. But now you've got this individual bringing back strange things constantly from Pakistan, and you know that there's some something really strange because you know that he's in telephonic connection with mm -hmm. some kind of sketchy folks, and that kicks off this this huge investigation, essentially. Now, at the beginning, it's not huge. At the beginning, it's, well, something's funny here. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know what it is, and he is in connection with people who have done bad things, so let's mm -hmm. put him under surveillance. Now, some of the people involved around him seem to start to pick up pretty early that they should be very, very careful with their communications, whether that's because Al-Qaeda taught them, mm -hmm. always be careful with your communications, or whether they had that sixth sense starting. By mid-July, talk about what Assad and Ali, um, this is Assad Sarwar, mm -hmm. and Ali did in Lloyd Park to sure. communicate. And the fact that the Brits were watching them do this, but couldn't tell what they were saying. Sure, sure. So what... So Ali meets a friend of his uh, named Asad Sarwar. They're in a park. It's a beautiful park. I've walked through it. Uh, parents bring their kids and throw around a ball, and and uh, it's it's actually quite nice. It's in Walthamstow. They're in this lush green area, and both of them suddenly lie down, face each other. Lie, they're lying down facing each other, and they cup their hands, and they start talking to each other, which is a really strange thing to do. And I actually talked to the head of the London Metropolitan Police Surveillance, and, and I, he goes, 
Listen, we we had no idea what they were doing. They were just literally sitting there talking to each other with their hands over their over their mouths. And what they were really trying to do was, if they were being monitored, which it turns out that they were, lip readers couldn't tell what they were saying. Mm-hmm. And there was enough space that you couldn't actually hear what they were saying. Mm-hmm. So they were having a completely confidential conversation with each other in the middle of a major public place. So you couldn't get a bug there uh, or you couldn't you couldn't uh, have an audio probe there. Mm-hmm. And police were just watching this and they said, we, we have no idea what they're saying. So it accomplished the purpose of having a private conversation that went on for a while. Mm-hmm. But obviously, it's even more alerting to the authorities. Yeah. They know now something is definitely going on here because why would they do that? in such a public place, drawing attention to themselves unless what they had to communicate was really important. Right, exactly. And in fact, we don't actually know what they talked about at that time because there was they never copped to it. They never said what they were talking about. And number two is the police never figured it out. The interesting thing is that the surveillance team didn't quite know what was going on. I mean, you, strange behavior by these two individuals. By the way, Assad Sarwar was not on anybody's list, even though he had been to Pakistan as well. So he's just this random guy uh, that he's having this very strange conversation with. That was obviously alertive. And so they start they start watching him too. And so finally the cops said, we got to break this up somehow. Yeah. And so they sent like a, a a couple of cops to say, hey, what are you guys doing? Like literally like making content. They said, oh, we're not doing anything. We're just uh, chatting. Just royal gossip. Yeah, yeah we're, just, right. we're just, yeah, it's all good. Yeah. It's interesting. This incredibly low tech way to communicate yeah. was actually the most effective. Don't mm-hmm. use your phones. Don't meet in a house. Don't meet in a coffee shop. Don't send emails. This was the best way to do it. But it was so alertive to the police that they knew that something big was happening. Right. It wasn't too many days later when they decided they needed full surveillance on everybody that they'd been watching because they knew something was happening and they they didn't have that level of information. So they had dozens of people that they needed to have full surveillance on. Mm -hmm. Now, in the movies, that's easy, right? Mm -hmm. Because you just see... The police suddenly put a few cars out there and they track a person and that's great. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it really works. When you have dozens of people who need full 24-7 surveillance, talk about what that means and how well-equipped or ill-equipped this unit (laughs) was to actually handle it by themselves there in London. So remember that, well, and this this is straight from the horse's mouth from the Met surveillance guy who actually authorized all of this. To do a 24-hour surveillance, you have about three shifts. Every shift requires anywhere between 8 and 10 people. So that is mm-hmm. up to 30 people per suspect, uh, watching them, walking them around, you know, going to their house, sitting outside their house, all that sort of stuff. Remember, you have to be unseen. And at, some, at one point, they were actually surveilling 20, 24 people. So we're talking about over 700 surveillance officers in one small area watching, trying not to be seen, and the, the risk for, for exposure was mm-hmm. very, very high. And so these guys are all professionals. But, but still, people make mistakes. People mess up. And these guys are – the plotters are really jittery about these things. And he's constantly – Ali's constantly looking around, looking to see he, – he would do things like uh, he'd be at the store, and he'd suddenly turn around to look for people watching him. Now, he actually never was caught. Nobody ever saw him, even though they were following him into the, into the underground. They followed him into London. They followed him back. Mm-hmm. Uh, they followed him, his, his wife, his, his infant son – through supermarkets and cemeteries and so forth. But there's sometimes you can't follow people. So there's a piece in the, in the, in the book where Asad Sarwar is building up all these chemicals. He's, he lives at home, of course. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't want to tell his parents that he's collecting chemical precursors for a naturally. bomb. <laughs> yeah, naturally. His parents had no idea. And so he said, listen, I got I to... Gotta, I got to hide it somewhere. And so there's a there's a wooded area near his house and he lives in this uh, town called High Wycombe which is between London and Oxford. And so he goes into the woods at 4 in the morning. And if you're by yourself in the woods at 4 in the morning and it's a very dense place, the police can't follow you. Right. Because if you Yeah, if you, that blows it, surveillance. It totally blows it. And then then it's game over. So and they know they know something's happening in the woods, but they have no idea what. They have no idea. They can't and at the time, they, uh, it was a very dense wood, so they, they couldn't have any sort of aerial surveillance. Mm-hmm. So these cops would just have to, and these surveillance guys, remember, there are eight to ten of them somewhere. They couldn't do anything, so they just sort of had to sit there and wait. And so he would show, he would go into the woods with a green bag, a white bag, a suitcase, a shovel. And then an hour later, he'd come out, and he wouldn't have these things. Right. They'd have no idea where it was. Now, we know now that he was hiding some of the explosives, right? He was hiding but some of the explosives. they didn't know that at the time. They had no idea. Yeah. And in fact... 
after this all went down, they surra- they they checked out a bunch of other mm-hmm. wooded areas and they found other explosives. Which they had no idea that was that was out there. They just sort of right. stumbled upon them. Amazing. So there are multiple stories going on here. There's the story of the plot itself and yeah. and how this somewhat loose lightly led from Pakistan because it was mostly delegated to uh to Ali mm-hmm. how this was running. There's the story of the investigation, the surveillance mm-hmm. and all of that. There's also the interaction between the Brits and the Americans. Yeah. Because the Brits are running this as Obviously, intelligence is involved, but they're running this as a strict law enforcement investigation, surveillance, collect evidence, Mm -hmm. because they plan on using this in court. Yes. Of course, they're telling the Americans what they're getting about this. Mm -hmm. And the Americans, in a counterterrorism dominant posture, are saying, well, when are you going to take this cell down? Mm -hmm. Uh, When when are you going to do this? Don't, Don't we have enough? There's a lot of suspicious behavior. Can't you just arrest them? And there's this tension already. Yeah. And it appears that it really jacked up in, in August when audio that had been put into the uh, key flat in East London, uh, the surveillance inside the, the flat, picked up the plotters saying, California, Dallas, Chicago. Mm-hmm. And the U.S. government goes berserk. Yeah. What was the United States doing to try to bring this investigation to a close so that the possibility of any of these plotters actually getting to the United States, presumably to California, Dallas, Mm -hmm. and or Chicago, that they could mitigate that threat. Remember that you have Al-Qaeda, an Al-Qaeda cell building legitimate bombs, talking about American cities and Mm -hmm. states. Yes, the Americans lost their minds. And this is actually, I think this is a philosophical issue. The, the, The Americans saw this as a war and the British saw this as a police action. And had this been another country, had this been in, in another country that was not the UK, mm-hmm. maybe the Americans could have gone on, in and done unilateral issue, some sort of unilateral actions. But that really, you can't really do that in the UK with all these individuals, obviously with a competent law enforcement intelligence service. Right. So one of the things was as well, how can we, how can we put pressure, how can we bring this thing to an end? Because... At the time, President Bush kept asking assistant to the president for Homeland Security and counterterrorism, Fran Townsend, mm-hmm. should we shut down the should we shut down the the Eastern Corridor to uh, airspace? Every twenty four hours, she would ask this, and she would go and talk to the CIA and talk to DHS and 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 other folks and said, like, what do you think? And every twenty four hours, they said, well, I don't think we should do that. And so Fran had to make that decision. Mm-hmm. She should say. Okay, Mr. President, I think we can fly for another 24 hours. I mean, at this point, F- Fran Townsend is sleeping on her couch at the White House because mm-hmm. you never knew when something was going to happen. Right. And what do you do? Remember, it's also August, so the president is on vacation down down in Crawford, mm-hmm. you know, getting clear rid and brush. of brush. Clear yeah. and brush. He's always clear and brush. Still for getting reason. briefings every day, still yeah. in communication with the White House, yeah. but everybody in August is dispersed. Everybody's dispersed. Uh, Vice President Cheney was back in his ranch in, in Wyoming. Prime Minister Blair is actually in the in the Caribbean, just like hanging out with his family. And yet, there's this massive, incredibly tense relationship and this 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 investigation going on. And yet all the policymakers are are actually outside of where they need to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you actually have this 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 strange tension. And yet, you uh, the other issue that you actually that that one has to think about is nothing ever leaked. To the press, right. which I find fascinating. Mm-hmm. This was such a huge investigation, and nobody talked. And I can understand from the British perspective, they're actually much more tight lit. But here in the United States, we we leak like a sieve. I mean, right. there is all people are always talking. But isn't there a lesson there? Because uh, if I understand it correctly, it was compartmented fairly well in the United States. That is, they weren't telling thousands of TSA screeners. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we think there's something having to do with hydrogen peroxide, mm-hmm. and by that point. They were starting to realize, okay, they might try to smuggle something on the airplane, and it might be in liquid containers, but they weren't telling anybody that yet. Yeah, they weren't telling anybody. In fact, the the administrator of TSA, this is the number one guy at TSA, mm-hmm. didn't find out about this whole plot until about four or five days beforehand, before the whole, everything all went down. That's amazing. Which is, yeah, pretty also crazy because he's the head of the TSA, and right. his, his counterpart in the UK was briefed on it the entire time. What really... Started to move this forward. Two events I'll, I'll talk about that move this forward to taking down the plotters later than the United States government would have liked, earlier mm-hmm. than the British government would have liked. One was August 6th when Ali goes to an internet cafe 
and he's searching. Yeah, remember on, those? Oh, I, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I had some good memories yeah. reading about these. But he used them a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, going into different internet cafes, searching things. Uh, good, good tradecraft, mm-hmm. right? Except that the Brits were all over him, mm-hmm. and, and they did discover what he was doing. And he was there searching on and saving data on seven flights. What did those flights have in common that took this to a new level? All those flights were leaving London Heathrow Airport to North America, to New York, to Chicago, to, I think one went to Montreal, Mm -hmm. uh, other places, all within a two-hour time frame. Hmm. He was looking up all these flights, not looking up return flights, just looking up one-way flights. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because we, I talked to, when I talked to the surveillance guys, they actually had to, the only reason why they knew about this was because, I mean, and think about these little internet cafes that are these small little rinky-dink places with all these computers and people sort of, you know, typing away at their computers. They actually sent in a surveillance officer to look at him and look at his screen because he's obviously hiding all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And this is a, it was a young woman in her 20s, went in there and actually just looked over and looked at his at his at his screen and said, you know, saw all these these this flight information, also things for Heathrow Airport, uh, and obviously reported it. And that's when you knew that this thing is going to go live really soon. Mm-hmm. Don't know when, but something's really bad. If he's looking at flight already, flight information, you know that he's already moving pretty fast. There are, there are at least weeks, but probably days. Potentially. From, from moving forward. And all of them leaving within that period of time means that there could have been presumably seven planes. Mm-hmm. Maybe he would search on more later, but at yeah. least seven planes that would be in the air at the same time. Some of them That's over right. the Atlantic, some of them presumably over or landing in American cities. That's right. And with the devices they were, if if executed properly, with mm-hmm. the devices they had, they could take down the airliner, killing hundreds of people on each plane mm-hmm. and presumably hundreds or thousands of people if they were flying into a city at the right time. Right. Or over a chemical factory or Absolutely. over a dam or over anything. And yeah. that was one of the that was one of the nightmare scenarios that the United States could have spilled out. Uh, I mean, if you blew up seven planes over the Atlantic, you'd kill, you know, let's say there are 240 people per plane. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people die. A thousand people. A lot, right. a lot of people. It would destroy the entire sort of civil aviation industry. Because remember, at this time, 9-11 had just happened five years ago. But also the entire civil aviation system, all these airlines were going bankrupt mm-hmm. uh, at the time for a variety of reasons. Right. The and economic so, impact would have been gigantic. En- enormous. Right. Enormous. Right. So... That's one event is the the internet searches on the planes yeah. and the flights. The other one that really forced a move happened in Pakistan of all places. Yeah. When uh, among others, Jose Rodriguez, the deputy director of operations at CIA, was having meetings with Pakistani officials and he learned that Raouf, who everybody was curious about now and they were mm-hmm. watching him, that he was on the move because he foolishly left one of his cell phones on and they could track this movement Rookie through move. Pakistan. Rookie move. He should have known better. But he was getting potentially away from coverage. They had a mm-hmm. pretty good picture of where he was and what he was doing, but he was heading and he could have gone into the tribal areas. He could have disappeared and gone dark. So he made a choice. Mm-hmm. What, did, what, did, what did Jose decide? So there was a there was a intersection near a railway junction in the middle of nowhere. ISI, the Pakistani spy agency, mm-hmm. had a barrier, had, had some guys there. Actually, there was actually an agency person on the ground there giving technical assistance as well. Mm-hmm. And Jose Rodriguez and the, the station chief at the time and the senior folks at the ISI were all traveling in a Jeep, going to dinner of all places. They, everybody gets a phone call saying, Rashid Rauf is in this bus. Mm-hmm. He's coming toward the checkpoint. What do we do, boss? And they all kind of look at each other. And they all look at Jose. Jose says, take him down. Now, he did not have, he did not have explicit instructions from the president or the CIA director to make that choice. He had to make it in that moment because either Rauf was going to go through the checkpoint and perhaps go dark Mm -hmm. or we were going to pick him up. But there's a consequence if they pick him up, which they did. Right. How did the Brits feel? Let's put it that way. How did the Brits feel about them picking up Rauf at this Uh, point? I was told they were, quote, well, pretty well miffed about this. That's severe in uh, in English speak. That is is (laughs) British English. (laughs) And it's funny. I talked to... uh, a police reporter for for the BBC, and she and she was such a she's such a wonderful person, and she you know she has this very wonderful like 
understated British way of saying this. It's like pretty well miffed. It's like you just jump started at a humongous investigation, which we told you don't do, and yeah. you did it, and, and, and those Americans did it anyways. Because by arresting Rauf, mm-hmm. he had been in communication by email. Constant, lots constant, of code words. Lots but, of code words, constant emails, constant phone calls. With a lot with, of these people. Yeah, they, and he, suddenly he goes, he goes off, off the grid, grid completely. Mm-hmm. They think that the plotters in London are going to realize something has happened and execute the plot? Execute the or plot or destroy everything. Themselves. And then yeah. you've got a fully functional Al-Qaeda cell yeah. with 20, 24 people, more or less, mm-hmm. in London that could be you know, activated by somebody else at some point because they've all got they all have the connections. They all have the they know how to build bombs. They know how to do everything. Mm-hmm. And so the decision was made to go out and arrest literally everybody. Mm-hmm. The the interesting part was Ali, this the, the ringleader, and Asad Sarwar, who was the quartermaster who was collecting all these chemical precursors, they just so happened to be hanging out at a car park late at night on the 9th of August. And they're just sitting there chit-chatting, surveillance teams watching them, trying to listen to him, but they couldn't quite tell what they were saying. And they're just like walking around in the in the in the car park actually at the the Waltham Forest Town Council, which is their city hall in that area. Mm-hmm. And then they get, and then the surveillance folks get the get the call. They say, "Take these guys out right now. Just arrest them." The surveillance folks. The get surveillance. That call? The surveillance. That's people. not a typical call to the surveillance team. No, and remember, these are British surveillance team members. They don't have weapons. <laughs> Nobody has guns. And they say, "Like we're the surveillance team. We shouldn't do this." No, no, nope. Take them out right now. Armed response will be there shortly. So they said, "Okay." And so they just rush them. They literally rush them and say, "Police, police." They had no idea whether Ali and Sarwar had guns or a bomb right. in the car or were going to mm-hmm. fight or run or – they but, didn't know. But to their advantage, Ali and Sarwar didn't know that the surveillance team didn't have weapons either. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And somebody screams at you police on the ground or something like that. Yeah. You can fight or you can run or you can give up. And luckily for everybody, they gave up immediately. Did, did anybody in the, the core group of these plotters fight instead of giving up? So one of the people, remember this is Rashid Ralph's best friend, Muhammad Gulzar. Mm-hmm. They come to his door. It's it's very late at night, and they they bang on the door and say like, "Open up! It's the police!" And he basically and he looks through the the peephole and he says, "Obviously the police." Uh, and he says, "Nope, I'm not giving up." And so he starts turning off the lights and starts running into the back of the uh, the back of the flat that he was mm-hmm. in. And so obviously the police are ready for this, so they just bash down the door and grab him. But essentially everybody gave up. They mm-hmm. had no idea the cops were waiting. And when you have thirty cops or However many yep. police officers are, are coming to grab you, they just gave up. They just literally gave up. Nobody fought. So they just gave themselves up immediately. Now, they didn't know that they had everybody. And in fact, later on, there were some signs they clearly didn't have everybody because mm-hmm. of some evidence issues we'll talk about. Sure. But they didn't know. They didn't know. So there had to be a reaction in terms of transportation, specifically between London and the United States at mm-hmm. first and then mm-hmm. and then later, because now... They were arresting these people. They could actually take preventative measures on the flights without revealing their hand. And, That's and right. So what happened? What was the the TSA reaction? Of course, I'm sure they had been briefed so adequately that <laughs> the airlines knew everything that would happen, hmm. and there was a smooth adjustment at U.S. Of airports. Of course, of course. You know, one of the funny things was is the TSA <laughs> administrator was calling all the heads of the American Airlines, United, Delta, et cetera. Uh, he was calling from some DHS facility mm-hmm. and using the using the phone but it was it was a strange facility with a with a like a handwritten thing on the on the phone itself hmm. nobody could leave a message back so if if it, oh. if it was like middle of the night and he's and the TSA administrator you don't know who it is calling from a random number in DC and you're the the you're literally the CEO of American Airlines you might not pick that up you wouldn't pick it up he said yeah. what's going on here here in the United States we rolled out all these no liquids for anybody mm-hmm. at 4 or 5 in the morning which means the next day, which was August 10th, complete chaos in all airports everywhere. If you remember, I, I have I have stories of, of people in the book where they would just show up and, and TSA guys would actually have to take these humongous bins because you show up with your drinks and your coffee and your, right. you your, your fine Kentucky all bourbon. Your trees yeah, and everything. Your, everything. You have to chuck all it. Gone. All, all gone. gone. Everything's gone. Yeah. And with no warning. No warning at all. Mm-hmm. And the t- they had to brief all these thousands of TSA employees this is what's going to happen immediately. TSA had to deal with this thing. One of the funny things I learned about the book in the book was TSA, a lot of these offices don't have major printers. Mm-hmm. And so they had to actually go out to Kinko's and write down no more no more liquids at literally every single gate. So Kinko's 
thank you for helping. Thank you for serving your country. <laughs> at, I think at JFK, they had to handwrite everything, like 250 letters, uh, 250 notes everywhere. And so that's just here in the United States. In, in the UK, by that time, by 4 or 5 in the morning, it's already uh, the morning rush mm-hmm. hour for planes already. You know, so there's mm-hmm. things flying into, into the UK because, remember, London is the gateway to Europe. So they had to shut down just about everything in mm-hmm. that place. Um, so it was chaos for a long time. They figured it out after about a week, and you know, people got. We ended their, up getting to that three one one rule. Yeah, we got to that three one one rule. We could have some liquids, but not a lot, and right. and that was a calculated risk because they knew that with any amount of liquid coming in with this method mm-hmm. they were using of getting the explosives into sealed bottles mm-hmm. through a very small aperture and then sealing that, mm-hmm. that yeah, you could take down the airplane if done the right way. Yeah. You probably could. There's there's some confusion about it. But if you have enough small bottles with enough people on the plane who get yeah. together, you probably could do the same thing. Mm-hmm. But the idea was you can't you can't shut down aviation almost completely by having no liquids right. or containers of any type. And people people are going to defect immediately. I mean, they're, people cheat. They're, yeah. People are going to cheat. Not just people. Millions of people are going to cheat. I mean, if think about it think about taking liquids onto planes you can still you know put things in other bottles you can still put things in things that don't look like bottles you can put things in sponges that yeah. are obviously not bottles so there are millions of ways to cheat yeah. our technical capabilities in the United States elsewhere are not equipped and our personnel are not equipped to to find everybody and remember the longer lines you've got at TSA at the airports that really upsets the airlines because right. you need to get people onto planes to fly to make money and so it's this constant tension between getting people through security onto planes to where they need to go. There's a, this economic sort of question, and then there's a security question. And mm-hmm. kind of finding that finding that that middle ground has always been extremely uneasy here in the United States, even be, even before 9-11. Right. So at this point, they understand the plot. And, of course, through the, the uh, interrogations of the suspects, mm-hmm. that they, they get more about what happened so that we now understand, yes, this was – a big time plot yep. uh, could have killed as many or more people than 9/11, mm-hmm. and probably taken the international economy down because of the sure. airline industry and all of its uh, secondary and tertiary effects. Mm-hmm. But there are still a couple of unknowns regarding this whole operation. One of them has to do with all of the plotters in London itself and the weapons, the devices they were creating, because you found in your research that. Somebody was out there destroying evidence, and they found yeah. some destroyed containers that were clearly linked to this, but they never found the people involved. Talk through they that never, a little bit. Uh, so there's this humongous dragnet. All these people are arrested. It becomes it's front page news for, for a very long time in the UK, also here in the United States. And then about a week later, the cops are doing their investigation, and along the M40 motorway and the highway in the UK, some of the police and the Thames Valley police find bottles with concentrated hydrogen peroxide, the the very chemicals mm-hmm. that they were going to use to, to blow up these things. And they were just on the side of the road. Somebody was destroying evidence, and that somebody was never found. They had no idea. They never f- pulled a fingerprint from these bottles. It was just there. So there are people who were deliberately destroying evidence mm. that were never arrested. Or maybe they were arrested and they were they got out and they just... Uh, right. Wh- why on earth would you would you do this and dump it on the side of the road? Mm-hmm. But those individuals, individual or individuals, were never found. Another part was when they arrested all these people, they went through their, their phones and their emails, and et cetera. They found all these other networks to other people. Mm-hmm. There's a strain, there was a strange comment made by Rashid Raouf to Ali, and he's talking to his, his third partner, Gulzar. And he says, don't give Gulzar all the explosives. Hmm. Why would Gulzar need any of the explosives? He was not part of this plot. I mean, he was not... One of the, the yeah. bombers. Why would you give him anything? Hmm. Which means to me, you know, this is one of those the dog that doesn't bark kind of situations. Mm-hmm. He was going to give it to somebody else. Who is that somebody else? We don't know. We don't know. The other big mystery is about Rauf himself. So mm-hmm. the Pakistanis picked him up from that bus and interrogated him themselves. Yeah. The U.S. expected to get access to him, even if not right away, to ask their own questions. This never happened. The Pakistanis never offered him up. Mm-hmm. What happened to Rauf? Well, and I actually talked to several senior CIA officers at the time. Remember, this is during this this whole time when we are wrapping up all kinds of Al Qaeda guys in Pakistan and elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of these guys are being rendered to the United States over this over this this period. A lot of these guys are still in Guantanamo Bay, arresting people, et cetera, et cetera. 
Rashid Rauf is, and I asked them, I didn't realize until kind of toward the end of my research, is basically the only person they never actually allowed us to sit and talk to hmm. in jail. The reason why is because Rashid Rauf tells his interrogators that he is a, quote, Kashmiri freedom fighter. He's Kashmiri. And he was, quote, trained in Kashmir. And he's brothers-in-law with this fellow named Masood Azhar, who is a famous jihadist who the ISI works with and has worked with. The Pakistani ISI working closely with these Kashmiri groups. Incredibly closely. In fact, the ISI built these groups to fight uh, the Indians Mm -hmm. in Indian-controlled Kashmir. And so very quickly, they find out that the ISI might have trained him in the first place. Oops. Oops. That's very embarrassing. And so basically what happened was the Pakistanis just stonewalled the Americans, mm-hmm. completely stonewalled. And, and you don't have to take my word for it. I actually have a declassified document in my, in my book, and it's in the, in the picture section, that Director Mueller, who was the director of the FBI, contacts a senior person at the, in Pakistan saying, we're sending two uh, FBI interrogators to Pakistan to interrogate this person. We'll do it the right way with the Miranda rights. And mm-hmm. we just want the evidence to, you know, just to make sure what's going on. Uh, the response was, Thank you, Director Mueller. We'll take it under consideration. Or we'll take it under advisement. Ooh. Uh, if you ever use that excuse against somebody, off. it means like you're getting the brush off. And there's, there's another declassified document that I have there that these, these, these two interrogators hung out in Pakistan at the embassy for about a week, 10 days, and then just went home because they never got to talk to them. The, the jail is literally an hour away from the embassy. So they could have shown up at any point. Right. And then Rashid Rauf escapes. Wait, what? Yes, he escapes. How did that happen? How how do how does one escape a maximum security prison? And you are a major Al Qaeda terrorist, and and I, I I believe he's the only Al Qaeda terrorist who's ever escaped from Pakistani custody. He was he was going to a court meeting, and then suddenly he just disappears. He and, just disappears. And I'm guessing they have not seen him since. Nope, he disappears completely. How convenient! How convenient for everybody involved. Right. Well, that points to one of the takeaways here, which is the international cooperation that led to the takedown of Operation Overt, the Brits, the Americans, and the Pakistanis, up to and including grabbing Rauf. Mm -hmm. But things changed after Operation Overt. The Brits and the Americans worked more closely together than ever, although the Brits were still a little miffed at the way the Americans did it. Mm -hmm. But it it solidified that relationship in some ways. Mm -hmm. But the Pakistani relationship with the Americans changed, didn't it? It did. And Op Overt was perhaps the last major anti-Al-Qaeda plot that the U.S. worked with Pakistan. So the next year was 2007. The United States tried to capture or kill a variety of of Al-Qaeda operatives, and I believe it was zero for 27. So there was a question at the CIA that, are these guys being warned? Mm. Get out of that car. You know, drop your, your phone. Get out of that, that safe house because the Americans are coming. And eventually, director of the CIA, General Hayden, went to President Bush saying, like, listen, the Pakistanis are, are playing some double game. We don't know why they're doing this, but mm-hmm. they are warning these al-Qaeda operatives. And over the course of several months, eventually, President Bush says, okay, fine, just do unilateral ops in Pakistan itself. And so if you actually look at the data, you look at these UAV operations, these, these operations where we, where we hit various places in, in Pakistan, between 2004 and 2007, there were, there were maybe under 10 each. And then suddenly, in 2007, 2008, you see a major increase. And you 2009, you see even a larger increase. 2010, you see even a larger increase in unilateral drone operations. And I have this, there was an ISI brigadier who actually said, by 2007, 2008, the, the CIA was not talking to us at all. Hmm. Uh, one final part is around that time in 2008 was when the Mumbai attack occurs, uh, if you recall that. The, the attack on the hotel. In, attack uh, on the hotel, right. attack on uh, the Jewish community center, yep, a yep. variety of other places. The head of ISI told the Pakistani ambassador of the United States, quote, these were our guys, but not our operation. Hmm. It's pretty pretty damning, I think. And then he came right. to he came to CIA to give his, his briefing, and he was, a, from what I understand, a rambling briefing because I talked to two people who were in the, in the room at the time. And at the end of his briefing, Director Hayden says, frankly, that's all BS. And he didn't (laughs) say BS. He said something (laughs) a little stronger. Yeah. But this is a family podcast. So. Right. uh, And so that's when the the wheels really came off. 
Mm-hmm. And then, of course, a couple of years later was the Bin Laden raid, which which yeah. <laughs> sank things to new lows. Right. Well, there are a couple of big takeaways from this, and you've already addressed one at the top, which is the the resiliency factor, the mm-hmm. fact that the the British population bounced back much more quickly in in most ways than the American population after 9-11. Sure. Different scale of attack, yes. Of course. But hitting the tube, hitting the buses, they came back within within days, even hours in mm-hmm. some ways. Yeah. But the other one that I want to talk about, the other takeaway is the importance of an element in counterterrorism that we tend to overlook, like people like us who have worked in national level intelligence. Mm-hmm. It's all about CIA and it's all about MI5 yeah. and it's all about ISI mm-hmm. and the DS. It's, and we forget about the local police. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how this entire story, what does it tell you about the importance of local police in major counterterrorism investigations? You need cops to carry out counterterrorism. And that's just the way it is. I mean, obviously, CIA and MI6 and all these national level groups, kind of what you said, get all the glory. But the cops are the ones who actually have to go and surveil these guys who have to write out all these things they have to they are the ones who are empowered to arrest them in the uk mi5 can't arrest anybody that the local mm-hmm. police actually have to do it and so they are the ones they are the ones who can marshal hundreds of people hundreds of law enforcement officials to actually go and do the things that need to get done in the united states especially after oppo vert there was a question and i talked to some some wonderful people at, at nypd after overt happened nypd said we don't have the capacity to to surveil twenty four people for twenty four hours a day. We just don't have the we just don't have the ability, and so and obviously the FBI cannot do it all by themselves. Uh, and so you completely need law enforcement, local law enforcement, to work with national level assets in a harmonious way, and not one of the ways that you see in the movies where the, the cops don't like the FBI, don't like the CIA, and they all don't work together. You need an excellent working relationship over time over. Not even just people, but I mean, just systems have to work together mm-hmm. for us to actually fight terrorism. Because those, the cops, in my view, the cops are the the unsung heroes of this whole process. CIA, MI6, MI5 get the glory. London Met Police, Tans Valley Police did all the work. Aki, thank you for your research and thanks for sharing it with us. Thank you so much. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please share this podcast and rate this podcast, but also take some time to share and rate our other podcasts in the Lawfare family. That includes Rational Security and Chatter. This episode is edited and produced by Jen Pachahowell. Kara Schillen at Goat Rodeo was our audio engineer, and Sophia Yan performed our music. As always, thanks for listening.